Here in this video lecture, we're going to be looking at Adam Smith's An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. So Adam Smith was a Scottish philosopher and uh, uh, someone who worked with government and who influenced uh, um, theories of capitalism, the entire idea of laissez-faire, right? A, a, a approach to uh, the economy where the government, you know, laissez-faire keeps its hands off, right? This free market uh, um, system originates with Adam Smith. And so in Smith, we get an account of uh, the origin, the historical origins of capitalism, what capitalism is and how it's different from previous systems and other interpretations, with the chief uh, question being, how is it that uh, some nations remain poor and other nations uh, increase their wealth? He first begins with the division of labor because it is social relations that are so different compared to previous systems. So division of labor takes place when in a business setting, we could say, especially, you know, I think the best uh, uh, kind of conception of this is maybe on the factory floor is where you have uh, 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 um, tasks divided up among workers. And what happens is through division of labor, he argues productive powers are actually improved, that you're able to actually increase the production of goods. He says, what is the work of one man in a rude society, so a, a poorer society, being generally that of several in an improved one? So in a poorer society, you typically have someone who is skilled at many things. So let's say we could think of this as being um, some kind of uh, uh, like a smith, right? A smith who is able to make uh, 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 swords and shields and other things like that, right? Involved in, uh, uh, um, you know, the 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 uh, um, malle ma making iron, let's say, like more malleable, right? And beating it and forming it into different things that are useful for for a variety of of, of uh, uses. Well, it takes someone. A lot of time just to develop, uh, let's say, one sword, for example, or to develop um, one one train, right? That might be used on um, a railroad track. Or to think of modern society, right? Imagine that it was the case because you know uh, uh, you would have someone who is skilled in the entire production, we could say, of a car. And so, what you it used to be the case that you would go to that one person who who you know you want to purchase a car for them. Of course, cars didn't exist. We're talking maybe uh, the fifteenth century, fourteenth earlier, and so on, right? But let's say if this you know those kind of social relations and labor practices existed now, you would go to one person, a we'll say a car smith, right? And you'd say, I want to purchase, let's say, a Honda Accord, and they would have to be knowledgeable about the entire makeup of a car. From the tires to the computer chips to the windshields uh, uh, to the bodywork to the seats, everything, right? Now, obviously, uh, it would take a long time for a single individual to make a car, but imagine instead that you have one person who makes the windshield, one person who makes the tires, one person who makes uh, the bumpers, one person who makes the seats, one person who makes the computer chips, and so on, right? That car is going to be produced a lot faster when you divide up the tasks like that for many different reasons, right? And that's what the division of labor is. It divides up the tasks needed to produce some good. So I want to look at this example he gives here of a pin maker. So he says, to take an example, therefore, from a very trifling manufacturer, but one in which the division of labor has been very often taken notice of, the trade of the pin maker. So someone who makes pins for machines without which the machines could not exist. A workman not educated to this business, which the division of labor has rendered a distinct trade, nor acquainted with the use of the machinery employed in it, to the invention of which the same division of labor has probably given occasion, could scarce, perhaps with his utmost industry, make one pin in a day, and certainly could not make 20. So he's saying here, right, it would take a pin maker one day to make one pin. They certainly could not make 20 in one day. 
He says, though, but in the way in which this business is now carried on, thanks to the division of labor, and the dissemination, really, proliferation of the division of labor, and, you know, specifically he's talking about uh, um, 18th century England, but in the way in which this business is now carried on, not only the whole work is a peculiar trade, but it is divided into a number of branches, of which the greater part are likewise peculiar trades. One man draws out the wire, another straightens it, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head. To make the head requires two or three distinct operations. To put it on is a peculiar business. To whiten the pins is another. It is even a trade by itself to put them into the paper. And the important business of making a pin is, in this manner, divided into about 18 distinct operations, which, in some manufactories, are all performed by distinct hands, though in others, the same man will sometimes perform two or three of them. So here in this case, right, you're able to produce, uh, as he says here, uh, uh, 48,000 pins in one day where it takes one person to make one pin a day, maybe if they're really skilled, they could make a few pins a day. You divide up the tasks involved in, in making a pin and you can make 48,000 pins a day. Now what's actually involved in the division of labor are three things. First, increase of dexterity in every particular work person. So the person who needs to draw the wire, right, they're going to be uh, uh, particularly uh, attuned to doing whatever quickly is needed. If you've ever seen a video of someone on an assembly line, right, the way in which they move quickly, it's as almost uh, they don't, like they don't have to think. It's second nature. It's habituated in ways that if someone has to perform many different tasks, they don't have the same kind of dexterity with each particular task because they're constantly having to rethink about, you know, using their brain. What do I have to do now? How do I position my hands? and things like that. Whereas if you do something that's repetitive, the dexterity involved in that labor increases. Second thing, the saving of time, which is <clears throat> commonly lost in passing from one species of work to another. So if I'm gonna manufacture a car by myself, it's gonna take a lot more time for the fact that I have to stop working on uh, maybe the tires. Then I have to rethink, okay, what it is that I need to do next, because I was in a different mindset that involves making tires as compared to making the windshields, right, with glass. So now not only do I have to change my mindset and, and think about what it is I have to do in my approach then to that labor, I then have to get the tools, set up the workplace and everything else, right? Well, if you have the task divided up, you don't lose that time that's lost in passing from one part of the work uh, to another. The third circumstance is the invention of a great number of machines which facilitate and abridge labor, enabling one person to do the work of many. So because of the division of labor, you can use machines that perhaps like a, a conveyor belt, for example, moves objects, right, down a line from one person to another very quickly, as where if it was one or two people making the object, you could not have that kind of speed, for example, in making uh, uh, whatever good it is that you're producing. Right? And so what Smith is getting at here is something fascinating, something new in the history of humankind, whereby it used to be the case that perhaps one person, if they provided for their family, right, they would have to be a farmer, they would have to make their own clothes, and they would have to do other things that provide for their subsistence. Whereas now what he's explaining is something new has emerged in the uh, uh, 18th century, whereby now you have many people doing just specific tasks as opposed to many people doing many tasks. Now, he argues that the principal cause of the division of labor is found in human nature, that it is the propensity to barter and trade, which has slowly led to the phenomenon of the division of labor. It is this natural a uh, way in which human beings maybe sees something else that another human has and says, hey, like I have three apples and you have three bananas. I would like a banana. Maybe you'd like an apple. We can trade an apple for a banana. And this is something you don't find in human beings. So let's look at uh, how he explains this here. He says, in civilized society, 
He stands at all times in need of the operation, the cooperation, and assistance of great multitudes, while his whole life is scarce sufficient to gain the friendship of a few persons. In almost every other race of animals, each individual, when it has grown up to maturity, is entirely independent, and in its natural state has occasion for the assistance of no other living creature. Right? It, it's not the case that cats go up to other cats and they, they, they trade uh, certain things, or squirrels trade the nuts they've collected, uh, and, and so on. Although maybe there's a few obses uh, uh, exceptions, maybe bees or ants, we could say, but they don't trade it in the same way that human beings do, where it's uh, for reasons of self-interest. So he says, but man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. So it is not through benevolence of love and care for the other person that one trades, ultimately. And maybe that's how it looks on the surface, but deep down inside, right, it's due to uh, other desires, and the primary one, of course, being uh, self-preservation. He will be more likely to prevail if he can interest their self-love in his favor and show them that it is for their own advantage to do for him what he requires of them. So, right, if someone else, again, uh, let's say the person has the banana, okay, and, and you have the, you know, the bananas and you have the apples, how would you get them to trade with you? Would it be, you know, hey, like, uh, I'm a fellow human being, you know, and um, out of respect for fellow human beings, you, sh you should give me a banana, and out of respect for you all, I'll give you an apple, because it's just the right thing to do. Smith says, no, the best way to convince them is to say, this apple is good for you, right? It's got certain vitamins maybe that you don't have with your collection of bananas. And so it makes sense for you to trade a banana for an apple. So he says, whoever offers to another a bargain of any kind proposes to do this. Give me that which I want, and you shall have this which you want, is the meaning of every such offer. And it is in this manner that we obtain from one another the far greater part of those good offices which we stand in need of. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, their own love of themselves, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Now, of course, this kind of bartering has existed, as he's arguing, throughout humankind. But there's something different, the division of labor, whereby some people own uh, capital, machines, and other goods that need to be worked on, which they divide up then the tasks to be worked by basically an army of workers, right? Now, how do they do this? They do this again through this self-interest. Do this task for me. Well, it used to be 16 hours a day, six days a week. Now, thanks to unions and labor laws, it's, uh, um, you know, the average is supposed to be eight hours a day, five days a week, so 40 hours a week. Um, but again, the argument is this is for your own self-advantage to make money to provide for yourself. It's not just through that, though. There are actually macro or societal uh, gains from the division of labor as well. So Smith says that the division of labor has made it such that even a poor person in a rich society has access to resources greater than a king in a poor society. So if you look at, we'll say, not someone who's maybe living in poverty, but just a, a poor or working class person who has shelter, who has heat, who has running water, who uh, has a variety of foods, you know, they can go get pizza and ice cream and all sorts of things. They can, uh, uh, maybe they have Netflix and they can watch movies and things like that, right? That that person, is going to have access to a, a, a more diverse, a rich source of goods than a king in an ancient society or a poor society. So let's look further at some of the societal effects of the division of labor. So one of these is the fact that now, because of the division of labor, people specialize in their tasks. They're no longer what used to be called a renaissance man, where you uh, kind of do everything, and you're, you're, you're maybe not excellent at everything, but you're good at everything. Uh, and maybe, right, uh, to some extent, you uh, uh, are an artist, but also a farmer, or a baker, as well as a fisherman, or, or whatever else, right? 
Now you specialize. You are just simply a plumber, or you are simply a, a, a windshield repair person, right? Or, or whatever else. So Smith says, in the progress of society, philosophy or speculation, so there's just an example of one uh, profession, becomes, like uh, every other employment, the principal or sole trade and occupation of a particular class of citizens. Each individual becomes more expert in his own peculiar branch, more work is done upon the whole, and the quantity of science is considerably increased by it. So because people now specialize in their tasks, they become better at it, and this actually benefits the whole. It benefits everyone else. We should ask, though, to what extent does this specialization degrade human beings and their, their dignity? Does perhaps this end up treating humans like robots? Right? This is something to think about. One of the other societal effects is that the extreme differences we find between people thanks to the division of labor, we can know we're actually more a result of habit, custom, and education than it actually is of nature. So Smith says, many tribes of animals acknowledged to be all of the same species derive from nature a much more remarkable distinction of genius than what antecedent to custom and education appears to take place among men. So he says, By nature, a philosopher is not ingenious and disposition half so different from a street porter as a mastiff is from a greyhound or a greyhound from a spaniel or this last from a shepherd's dog. Those different tribes of animals, however, though all of the same species, are of scarce any use to one another. The strength of the mastiff is not, in the least, supported either by the swiftness of the greyhound or by the sagacity of the spaniel or by the docility of the shepherd's dog. The effects of those different geniuses and talents for want of the power or disposition to barter and exchange cannot be brought into a common stock and do not in the least contribute to the better accommodation and conveniency of the species. So that one spaniel, let's say, is better at, at hunting or something like that than another one doesn't actually contribute to the species of spaniels overall. Each animal is still obliged to support and defend itself separately and independently and derives no sort of advantage from that variety of talents with which nature has distinguished its fellows. Among men, on the contrary, the most dissimilar geniuses are of use to one another. The different produces, produces of their respective talents by the general disposition to truck, barter, and exchange being brought, as it were, into a common stock where every man may purchase whatever part of the produce of other men's talents he has occasion for. So it is because of the ability for humans, the natural propensity of humans to barter and trade, that uh, uh, the, the specialties of each individual and, and the genius of them in that specialty actually ends up benefiting everyone else as a whole, whereas that does not take place uh, uh, um, with other animals. Now, of course, what Smith is talking about here is the system known as capitalism. And to have the division of labor, you first need capital. So Smith roughly refers to this as stock, and sometimes he really means this as like any kind of goods. Uh, I'm just going to refer to it as capital uh, to be a bit more modern. And capital is defined as any resource which can be labored upon to increase its value or is used for other purposes to create value. So let's say, uh, uh, um, you know, if I uh, have a machine that produces phones, you know, a magical machine that just makes phones, that machine is capital because it, it produces things that, that end up whatever, you know, I might have bought the machine for, it produces things that, you know, exceed its own value. So it creates profit or money sometimes, right? We invest it in something else, the, the value of it grows, that would be an example of capital. But let's say if I just buy a bag of chips, well, that bag of chips is really only useful for being consumed. In that case, it's, it's not capital because it doesn't create value. Now, the accumulation of capital is not necessary in, in a society without the division of labor, Smith says. Think about pre-capitalist societies. It would not make sense to uh, 
have those machines like in a factory it would not make sense to have a, a, a stockpile of uh, money or, or stocks right or whatever else uh, in a society where there is no division of labor the reason is you need people to work on uh, uh, that capital you need per people to work the machines otherwise it doesn't produce value so you need actually um certain uh, material conditions you need certain uh, uh, background conditions certain uh, social relations right that make possible then uh, uh, um, the accumulation of capital for the sake of profit now in a developed society it is almost impossible actually for one's own individual labor to provide for their subsistence whereas in pre-capitalist societies one person uh, uh, you know could be a day laborer right and they can perform many different tasks uh, one person can be a farmer and again make their own clothes build their own house so in that sense right do carpentry and so on and provide for their own subsistence in capitalism sometimes that's possible for but for the most part it's not it's not feasible right? it's not going to make it possible for you to uh, uh, survive so the accumulation of capital then in uh, uh, for the division of labor to occur must be previous for the division of labor but there's this double effect then. You need capital before the division of labor works, but as the division of labor then increases, so too does the exponential rate of capital accumulation end up growing. So you get capital, capital makes possible the division of labor, division of labor makes possible the growth in capital, which makes possible a further growth in the division of labor, and so on. So accumulation of capital naturally then leads to division of labor. Now we need to look at specifically capital and how we can divide up different kinds of capital. So when capital can last only a few days or weeks, Smith says that the owner of this capital does not think of deriving revenue from it. So let's say I uh, harvest some corn, okay? And I only harvest enough corn to last a few weeks. I don't think of well, what can I do with this corn uh, 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 to make more money or, or whatever else, right? Or to grow my capital. I think. I have this corn for a few weeks, how do I portion it out to survive over the next few weeks, right? So, so I have food to eat. What you need is capital, which is sufficient to man maintain someone's self for an extended period of time. So they can think, you know what? I can actually risk losing some of this capital and I'll still be okay. But if you only have a few weeks worth of capital, um, the risk is far too great of, because you have to, of course, wage it, of losing it and then starving. But if you have, let's say, enough capital sufficient to maintain a person for a few months or even years, then Smith thinks one naturally endeavors to derive revenue from the greater part of that capital. Now, there are two ways that capital yields profit. One is capital acting as a, cir as a circulating good. So in this case, we can think of money or products to be sold. In this case, circulating capitals can be employed in raising, manufacturing, or purchasing goods and then selling them again with a profit. So, uh, you know, all the things in shipping containers, for example, these are cases of circulating capital. Fixed capitals, though, are things that are used to produce the things that circulate. So these may be employed in the improvement of land, in the purchase of useful machines and instruments of trades, all the things that produce then uh, goods. We can also talk about uh, what Smith calls the general capital of society. So in that case, we're looking at the micro uh, kind of definitions of capital, but let's look at macro definitions of capital. So he says, that which is reserved for immediate consumption, which affords no revenue or profit, is the first kind of general capital of the society. So it is that kind which is just, uh, um, uh, you know, like a TV, for example, right? So you have TV, or again, I use the bag of chips, which is meant to be sold. And potentially selling a lot of them makes a profit, but you can't in that good in and of itself make a profit. The second kind is fixed capital. There are four examples of this. So the first is all useful machines and instruments of trade. So again, maybe machines in a warehouse uh, to make cars uh, and other things like that. Uh, tools, so maybe tools to farm or that a painter might use. The second kind of fixed capital, buildings rented out to house capital. So he's not talking about homes. In fact, 
Adam Smith had uh, pretty nasty things to say about landlords because landlords don't uh, produce any value. They don't they don't produce uh, capital that that benefits the rest of society. Uh, instead, he thinks they they actually act as leeches and they suck out uh, uh, the uh, capital value. But he's talking about are buildings that are rented out to house capital. So specifically, they facilitate fixed capital like those machines and instruments of trade. The third kind of fixed capital is improvements of land. So maybe you need to chop down some trees, irrigate some land, uh, put in a sewer system, other things like that, which make possible the facilitation of trade or farming or other things like that that aid in uh, uh, the production of goods. And the fourth kind of fixed capital is the acquired and useful abilities of all the inhabitants or members of, of the society. Uh, we can kind of think of this as like uh, maybe social capital or, or personal capital, right? Maybe the knowledge one acquires, which allows them to uh, uh, um, move up the class ladder or make more money or, or do more things which afford uh, um, uh, uh, the ability to, to increase profit, right? So education ends up playing into that role of uh, this kind of capital for them the, uh, that members of a society possess just in their person. Now, the third general kind of uh, capital of society is circulating capital. The four kinds are first money, second, uh, f food goods that are to be sold for consumption. The third is raw or semi-produced materials. And the fourth is produced goods to be sold for consumption. Now, the kind of theory of wealth that uh, Smith is arguing here goes against one of the other dominant theories of the time, mercantilism. So merc mercantilism was the economic theory that wealth was derived primarily from the possession of money. That the more money a, let's say, country has stockpiled, the more wealthy it was. Smith contradicts this theory. He says that wealth is actually not derived from the possession of money, but from the circulation of money. He says, it is the circulating capital which furnishes the materials and wages of labor and puts industry into motion. In a way, you can kind of think of it as like, uh, it's a certain game almost that's played that creates wealth, where you give out an IOU which makes possible someone else to take that IOU uh, and, and give it to someone else and so on, whereby no one actually calls on the, the IOU to be paid in full, but they all kind of uh, uh, take it as uh, um, this does have value because I believe it has value because other people believe it has value. So you, by, by uh, buying things and selling them, especially if you have the division of labor, you make possible the production of more goods. You increase demand, for example, increase the money supply, you increase demand, which makes it possible for then the more things people buy, the more it is that capitalists, those who own capital, uh, can invest in their capital resources to make more goods that people can then buy, which increases maybe, uh, you know, their standard of living and so on. So it's not simply the possession of wealth, and, and this is important because this means value is not derived from the thing itself, is derived from the practices of objects. Now, three things that are required though to put industry into motion. The first is you need materials to work upon. So you need uh, goods that you can actually turn into uh, products to be sold that people wanna buy. You also need the kind of goods uh, that exist to make fixed capital, to make machines, for example. So to some extent, the emergence of capitalism was definitely uh, historically, uh, uh, was historical in the sense that uh, it wasn't until certain discoveries were made uh, whereby uh, materials could be transformed so as to, let's say like the steam engine, for example, uh, produce a train which can transport goods a lot faster than you know, horses and carriages, let's say. Secondly, you need tools to work with. So this could be then the machines or, or other tools. Right? So we can think of like the spinning jenny or, or um, again, uh, uh, other kinds of like the pins, you know, that are made for machines that Smith talked about. All these different things which increase then the productivity of labor. Finally, the third thing you need is wages. You need wages to pay people. Otherwise, why, of course, are they going to work upon the capital that one might own. 
So Smith says, money is neither a material to work upon nor a tool to work with. And though the wages of the workmen are commonly paid to him in money, his real revenue, like that of all other men, consists not in the money, but in the money's worth. So you need wages. You need to pay something and, and you know, someone with something that uh, is valuable to them. So this, again, goes back to self-interest. So is you don't pay someone simply in the metal pieces. It's not the metal pieces that are valuable, but what can be got for them. How then that person can trade that in for something else that they desire. So Smith's idea is that capitalism, this new system that makes nations wealthier, functions whereby every individual pursues their own self-interest. That means they end up doing different things, but by everyone pursuing their own self-interest, they actually increase the well-being of everyone as a whole. So it's actually saying that self-interest isn't actually bad. If you leave people alone, that through a kind of invisible hand, society actually ends up improving itself. So in capitalism, according to Smith, every individual endeavors to employ capital accumulated nearest their home as they can. So his first argument is that one who um, uh, accumulates capital, uh, where they live, they're going to invest it, of course, where they live, where they can keep an eye on it. By doing so, they end up uh, uh, investing, we could say, in their community. And that means every individual then naturally prefers home trade to foreign trade. And by preferring home trade to foreign trade, they end up uh, uh, circulating wealth around their own community, thus, of course, uh, growing the wealth of that community. Now, the second step then in this is that every individual then who employs their capital in the support of home industry seeks to produce the greatest possible value from it. So, because people have uh, investments in their home industry, they want to seek the greatest you know, return from it, which means they want the entire society they live in to flourish. So through people leading, uh, pursuing their own self-interest, they actually end up uh, increasing the well-being of everyone else, right? As the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. Specifically, and here we should uh, get to the famous quote, he says, by preferring the support of domestic or this kind of home industry to that of foreign industry, he, this self-interested individual, intends only his own security. And by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. So it's not the case actually that someone who's pursuing their own self-interest needs to know uh, 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 what it is that will produce the greatest good. All they need to know is what is their own self-interest. By pursuing their own self-interest, almost kind of magically, Smith is saying, this ends up uh, increasing the wealth of a society. 